service today. We're so excited to be gathered in the sanctuary after so many months. Hallelujah. It is good to be here yes. in this wonderful blessing that God has provided for us. Would you join me today as we begin a brand new series? The series is three weeks long and I've entitled it Rising Above the Ruins. Rising Above the Ruins. And today we're going to look at, if you open your Bibles to 2 Chronicles chapter 34, 2 Chronicles chapter 34, um, also there's a corresponding part of this, the Bible that speaks of this, and it's 2 Kings chapter 22 and 23. But we're going to look at a man, a king of Judah, by the name of Josiah. Now Josiah, I was, I was so excited just the other Sunday in watching kids' time while I was participating, being behind the camera, and hearing again about this king, Josiah. Now, he was, he was a young man. He was not very old when he came to the throne. Let's look at 2 Chronicles chapter 34. We're going to read just the first four verses together and we will take from the rest of those scriptures as we go through. 2 Chronicles chapter 34, verse 1 through 4. Now listen carefully because there's some amazing things in these few verses that tell us about this guy. Now the kids can listen carefully because this will speak to every kid's heart. Josiah was eight years old. How old was he? Eight years old, eight years old when he became king. And he reigned in Jerusalem 31 years. He did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight and followed from doing and followed the example of his ancestor David. He did not turn away from doing what was right. During the eighth year of his reign, while he was still young, Josiah began to seek the God of his ancestor David. And then in the twelfth year, he began to purify Judah and Jerusalem, destroying all the pagan shrines, the Asherah poles, and the carved idols, and the cast images. He ordered that the altars of Baal be demolished, and that the incense altars which stood above them be broken down. He also made sure that the Asherah poles, the carved idols, and the cast images were smashed and scattered over the graves of those who had sacrificed to them. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word today. Thank you, Lord, that you speak to us. Lord, that we are not left alone. You are with us. Lord, you are working in us. And today, let your word speak life to our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now imagine what it would be like, well, many of the kids just went back to school a few weeks ago, what it would be like, instead of going to the third grade, you became king, or let's say you became president of the United States. Well, wouldn't that be something? Well, that's what happened to Josiah. Now, Josiah didn't come into a world wonderful, perfect world. He, he came into a world where the, the Israel had been previously divided into two kingdoms. Ten of the twelve tribes formed the northern kingdom, and two other tribes formed the southern kingdom. But 80 years before Josiah becomes king, God brought an end to the northern kingdom. And we actually, we actually have in the past six months, we have, we have heard about God speaking through a prophet saying, this is coming to you. But something interesting about the northern kingdom, though they were prophet after prophet, 
warning after warning that judgment would be coming, they did what? They ignored these commands. They ignored these calls for repenting. And so what happened is God dramatically judged them and removed them. The Assyrians came and killed many of them and the rest carried them away. And so the northern tribes of Israel were no more. Never returned. But Judah, the remaining, the remaining part of Israel, the southern kingdom had seen with their own eyes what God had done to the northern kingdom, what, how the judgment had played out. They had seen this all, and what do you think their response was? I would, would have thought that they would have repented, they would have fallen on their knees, they would have put on sackcloth as they did those days. They would have put ash on their heads and they would have turned away from their wicked ways and asked God for forgiveness that the prophets, what the prophets were saying was all too scary and too real. But that's not what they did. They did as the northern kingdom did. They paid no attention to the, what the prophets were saying. Micah, Zephaniah, Jeremiah, and Habakkuk had been speaking to them, warning them of impending judgment, and they did not obey. So when Josiah comes, and this eight-year-old becomes king, comes to the throne of Judah, he inherits a kingdom that's in absolute moral disarray and rampant idolatry. That meant they were worshipping all kinds of idols all over the place. Wherever you looked, there were fake gods and the idols all across the land. This was quite a time to step up to be king. Never mind being eight years old. Now, Josiah's family background, let's figure out uh, who, his, who his parents were, right? That, that usually tells, sometimes when you, when you have your children bring somebody or somebody home or something like that, you want to know who their parents are. You know, who, where do you come from? Well, let's find out who this new king's parents were. Maybe that will tell us a little bit more about it. Okay. So Josiah's grandfather, we'll go, we'll go to the grandfather, Manasseh. He ruled for 55 years. That's a long time that he was king. But he led the most despicable, disgusting life possible. Oh, those are tough words, Pastor. Well, you can go read about Manasseh all by yourself. We're not going to uncover too much about him. But how would you, how do you remember your grandfather? What do you think? Kids, what do you think when you when somebody says and talks to you about your grandfather? He was amazing, right? How many, how many of the kids have amazing grandfathers? Let me see. Okay, some of, how many of the adults have amazing or had amazing grandfathers, right? Yeah, so, so we, have good, we have good things to think about our grandfathers, but this boy king, this eight-year-old king, his grandfather, did all he could to remove the word of God from all of Judah. Oh, that wasn't all that he did. He replaced the worship of God with every kind of idol that you could possibly think about. And, and he went further. He actually sacrificed some of his own children to a pagan god. He, he at one point shed so much innocent blood that it filled Jerusalem from the one end to the other. He was not a good man. Josiah didn't have a good grandfather. Boy, grandfathers have a powerful influence over us. Amen, especially if you have a godly grandfather. So, 
Josiah didn't have a godly grandfather. But who was his father? Perhaps we know a little bit more about him by his father. Well, his father was so bad that, that he ruled only two years, and, and the palace servants decided they couldn't bear with him, and they killed him in two years. And this is the reason that Josiah gets thrust right in at eight years old to be king of Judah. Has no godly model to follow. His nation is out of control. God has announced and said judgment was coming. What does a child do in such a terrible situation? What does he do under these conditions? Well, he ruled for 31 years. And before his death at age 39, this young man would be used of God to lead his nation to one of the greatest revivals of all history. He would... Everybody would have thought that he was weak. He's but a child. He's a kid. He's not even, you know, he's still whack behind the ears, they would say. They would all have all kinds of things to say about this very young man. He was, he was incapable. But yet he guided this backslidden nation back to God. Now, kings and kids do not underestimate what God can do through you. Amen. Don't. Amen. God is calling you. He wants to use you. He wants, to, he wants you to be an intricate part in taking this nation and turning it back to God. Yes. Amen. You're not left out. It's not, it's not just the work of the adults. It is to, to all who are called by his name that have this opportunity. But we'll see through looking at Josiah exactly how and, and what was in his heart that led to this happening. Now, Josiah chose wholehearted devotion to that, that just means that he gave his whole self to worship God, to serve God. He gave his whole life to God. Now, you know what wholehearted means? What does wholehearted mean? With your whole heart. With your whole heart. So, so the opposite of, of is the opposite of half-hearted, right? And, and that's such a stark contrast to our modern Christianity with, with all its divided loyalties, one foot in the world and one foot with God. You know, mild enthusiasm, to put it at best. Half-baked obedience. Convenience-driven devotion. You know, don't be deceived to think that Compromise in the name of tolerance is right. Don't adjust your obedience and call it liberty. Don't, if thou elevate indulgence and call it relaxation. Don't shun devotion and say that you've escaped legalism. Don't reject living a holy life for God and say you are free. That's just half-baked Christianity. That's half-heartedness. Wholehearted means holding nothing back. It's genuine. It's costly. It's complete. It's fervent. It's hot. And it's whole. Come on, that is the kind of heart that... This king had, and that's the kind of heart we need today. Amen? Amen. Amen. Yes. But we have, to, we have to know that if we're going to serve the Lord wholeheartedly, it can't be half-baked. It can't be half with a half a heart. It has to be with everything we have got. Now, I've spent a lot of time to explain that, but I think it's necessary. 
today when, when we are lukewarm at best. Now, Josiah's 31 reign is summed up in 2 Kings 23, verse 25. It says, never before had there been a king like Josiah who turned to the Lord with all his heart and soul and strength, obeying all the laws of Moses, and there has never been a king like him since. This boy king did more than one thing right. Josiah's life exemplifies the power of God working in someone who is fully given to him. Amen? In an ordinary people who fully give themselves to him. But how does that happen? Choices. 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 Think about the choices that we make because we make choices that show if we are fully devoted or half-baked. Now verse 2 of chapter 34 of Second Chronicles, he says he did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight. He rose above the emptiness at home. Boy, it was empty. Think of his spiritual upbringing, his spiritual formation. There was nothing to go by. He didn't give in to the anti-God attitudes and the godless choices of his nation and his, his lineage, his parentage. He rose above the prevailing culture. Josiah pushed against the tide by setting simple personal priorities. More than anything else, he wanted a life that was pleasing to God. So he made choices that led to that. Verse 3 tells us that as he grew older, it tells us, verse 3 is a great verse, because it tells us from there, it says, it says basically he grew in his faith. He grew. He came as eight years old, and he didn't know much about God because he had no heritage but he made a choice, and he wanted to follow in God. And it says that, that his devotion to the Lord increased. By the time he was 16, after eight years, his determination to pursue the worship of God was clear. And in, by his 20th birthday, his character had been shaped by God. And he used it to institute a nationwide purging of every trace of idolatry in that country. By 26, he turned his attention to abandoned temple, which had not been attended. Now, the kings of Israel, the kings of Judah, had been so bad for so long that the temple had been left derelict, abandoned for 250 years. There was no trace of worship of God in the land. But Josiah, turns his attention to re-establishing re worship and setting that right. Verse 8, we didn't read that, but in the 18th year of his reign, after he had purified the land and the temple, Josiah appointed Shaphan, son of Az Azalia, Messiah, the governor of Jerusalem, and Joah, the son of Joaz, the royal historian, to repair the temple of the Lord his God. That speaks to me. I think it's time that we repair the temple of the Lord our God. Now, now I know that that we don't have a temple somewhere that we go to. I know that we are the temple, but it's time that we restore the temple. Now we can talk about that. And Pastor Rosell shared a long thing about about restoring the temple and temple maintenance. In fact. I think it's time that we consider personal temple maintenance. We get the, the dust off and the broken bits. Start putting it back together to reestablish true worship in our hearts. At every stage of Josiah's life, he wanted his life to be pleasing to God. Verse 2, 
continues and says he followed the example of his ancestor David. He looked back and he saw there was someone that he could take some cues from. And that was David. David was, and he's still regarded as the greatest king of Israel. But we've heard what was said about this king. So he took his cues and said, I want to be like my ancient grandfather. All right? He found a godly heritage to follow. You see, he was, he was in pursuit of God, and it wasn't just on and off, and it wasn't just now and again. It wasn't just a Sunday thing. The site integrated the right habits, the choices that he needed to make into, into the rhythms, into the habits, into the pattern of his days so that he would turn his heart to the Lord. See, there's a difference between doing what is right in the sight of people, I've learned this, and what in the sight of God. There's a big difference. And I believe that as our culture gets darker and darker, we are going to have greater and greater challenges to live our lives as believers. And we cannot afford compromise. You see, because what the people think we should live by and what the Word of God says is two very different things. We can only do what's right in the sight of the Lord. We can only obey his word. Josiah had many opportunities to take a detour, as we do. But he did not. Except at the end of his life, and we'll see that, he took a detour. He obeyed God's word. In Josiah's day, there was rampant ignorance of God's word. But it wasn't for the same reason that we have. Because I told you that his grandfather had done everything he could to eradicate the word of God from the land. Well, the opposite is true. We might say the Bible's out of schools. But, but the Bible's not out of our homes. It's not off of the racks of our stores. I mean, you can go to the dollar store and purchase a Bible. You can go online and you have a Bible. You, you have one on your phone. We are not without the Word of God, but yet we are so ignorant of the truth of God's Word. You see, whenever people do not read the Word of God for themselves, they are easily misled. They have no basis for evaluating or confronting their own behavior, never mind the behavior of those around them. And let me tell you that when you take the word of God and you apply it and you speak of what God says is wrong in the world today and you, you, you mention it from scripture, they are going to tell you that you should not judge. And they're even going to tell you that the Bible says you should not judge. They're going to tell you the Bible says that only God is able to judge. And then if you don't know the word of God, you will think they're right. But they're not. The word of God speaks for itself. And the word of God itself has a word of correction, of judgment, and of conviction to all who walk outside of the principles of God. See, we have to go to the Word of God, and when we speak it, people will come in with a whisper and say, is this really what it says? And if you don't know, you'll be deceived by the whisper. Don't be deceived by the whisper. Know the Word. We have to read the Word for ourselves. Now, it's amazing, see, you can't obey God's word if you don't know what it says. But it is not good enough to say that my pastor says, the word of God says. It's not good enough. It's not acceptable for us to live like that. It is for us to say, my pastor says it, said it, I checked it in the book. And the Bible says it. And therefore, I know it to be true. That is where we have to come to 
we have to look at the Word of God. We must read it all. You have to read the sections and step on our toes and the toes of others too. You see, Deuteronomy is probably Deuteronomy 28 is probably a section that they read. Because when one of the things that, that was discovered when, when Josiah went and he and he had them begin to clear and re reestablish the temple and repair it, is they discovered scrolls of the word of God. And as soon as they did, they brought these scrolls to Josiah and and they read to him the word of the Lord. Now Josiah had been, had been making corrections. He had, been, he had been sorting things out in the land. He had been eradicating idols. He had been setting his devotion of God. But he had never heard the word of the Lord. And it was read to him the first time. And when he did that, he even went further in eradicating idols. He, he made sure that everything, every scrap of idolatry was removed from the land. Why? Because the conviction of the word came. You see, before he heard the word of the Lord, he was doing what was right. But when he heard the word of the Lord, he got radical about it. Amen? So if we're not radicals because we don't know what the word is saying. We have to respond to the word of God. Now, Deuteronomy 28 is amazing. It will tell you all the blessings. But it will also tell you what happens if you don't walk in the ways of the Lord. We have to respond to the word. Josiah's response to the word of God was dramatic. He tore his clothes. He, 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 he gave a display of repentance that... He had heard the word of the Lord and that he humbled himself before God. But we see that the first time that Josiah heard the word of the Lord, it made a dramatic impact on his life. But we read later on, in, as we read about his life, there was a point where he now read the word for himself. He heard it, he repented, but when he read the word of God for himself, that made a dramatic change in his life. Josiah's reform purged the land of all idolatry. You see, we have to take strong action against sin. And the reason that we sometimes don't do it in our lives is that we have not, we have not taken the word of God in. Jesus said that if your eye causes you to lust, tear it out, or your right hand tempts you to adultery, cut it off. What is Jesus saying? We need to take dramatic steps to remove sin from our lives. And that we are helped to do that. We need to respond to the word of God. We have to listen to the prophets that God has set for us. And so... When Josiah had heard what the word of the Lord said, what the scriptures had said, he sent to the prophets and he went to find out what the prophet said. And he went to the prophet Huldah, who was a prophetess. And remember, when he took over, when he became king, there was already declared destruction over Judah. It was already declared that they would be Facing God's judgment. And so, when Josiah hears this word, he sends word to the prophet. He says, what must we do? What are we going to do? But the prophet turns around and says, yes, the, the promise of destruction will come. But because you have done right, you have humbled your heart, you have repented of your sin, and you have purged the land of all idols, it will not happen in your lifetime. Israel, Judah, had a reprieve because this man of God. You see, the purpose of the word of God isn't to make you feel warm and fuzzy, right? It is to confront and it speaks of God's judgment as well as his, as his love and mercy. You see, Scripture warns us 
about shopping around for those that tickle our ears. In other words, go and find, you know, flipping through the channels to find, well, isn't there somebody that's going to tell me what I want to hear? Never before have we ever been able to do that, but we can now. That's why we have to get to the Word of God. Because we have to find what God is saying to us. You see, because if we, if we just look for what pleases us, what, what satisfies us, you see, Paul tells us in 2 Timothy that they will turn our ears from hearing the truth and they will cause us to reject the truth and chase after myths. But not if we in the Word of God. We have this notion in the world today that all Christianity is about loving people and never offending any. Well, that's not true, as I've already said. Al, as we come and we declare the word of the Lord, there will be offense. You're going to offend people if you speak the word of the Lord. You don't like it? If we are well, can I say, can I be mean enough to say get over it? Was that, is that too straight? We're going to offend people when we speak the truth of God's word. And they're going to tell us that because we're offending them, we are hateful. Get over it. Because our mandate is to bring and speak the word of the Lord. It's not to avoid offending people. Our mandate is to speak the word of the Lord. It is not to avoid offending people. We don't set out to offend people. I'm not going out to see how many people can I offend today. But if I go and I say, I'm preaching the word, I'm declaring the word, and if you're offended, I have not come to offend you, but I have come to bring life and truth to you. God's word gives us everything that we need for life and for godliness. 2 Peter 1, 3 and 4. Even though Josiah lived in an evil day, he did seek after God and obeyed his word. We live in an evil day. God can do great things for you. Through us, how if you will seek him and obey his word. Boy, we are in need of a spiritual revival. Now, Josiah had a heart after God. We've already said this, and what did he do? He made the Lord a priority early on in his life. Now, now I want to speak to those who are early on their journey in life for a moment. Kids, I know you're drawing or looking at something, or keeping yourself busy. Make God a priority early in your life. Your parents will help you, but it's your decision. Choose that, that God first before everything. This is what this king did. He was 16 when he began seeking the Lord. And he didn't come from a godly home. Most of you have a great godly heritage. And some people say, well, I didn't grow up with this stuff. It doesn't matter. This king didn't. He didn't grow up in the temple. The temple wasn't there. It was in ruins. He didn't see the worship of God. He only saw idolatry. But he made it point that he was going to serve the Lord. He lived in an evil day. But he began to seek the Lord. You see... There's a lot of people that will speak, that will say to teenagers, or about teenagers, and the teenagers have all heard this. Well, it's okay, it's right. Every, bar, every child, every teenager takes a turn in the world and, and walks away from God. They go through a rebellious stage. And let me tell you, today, that is a lie from the pit of hell. From hell. You do not need to walk in the world. You do not need to take a turn into the world for any reason. You need to give yourself to God early on. Yes. Yes. You do not need to go through a rebellious phase. Yes. Yes, right. Because as we speak that over our children, as we speak that in our home, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yes. Yes. 
where Christian parents expect their teens to rebel. Do not even say it. So many kids feel today that they'll never be well adjusted. And people say it all the time if they don't take a tour in the world. No, you will be perfectly well adjusted as you devote yourself to God and to his word and to his church. You will be well adjusted. You do not need anything else but his word, his church, and his spirit. Amen. There is no need to speak these lies Amen. over any generation. See, that's the word of Satan. How else can I say it? I want every young person to hear this. You will never, ever regret yes. avoiding the world, right. avoiding the drugs, avoiding the lures of the world, avoiding the sin that there is. You will never, ever regret devoting your life fully to God. Can you hear me? Because sin brings regret, yes. but serving God never does. Yes. You can avoid drugs, alcohol, you can avoid sexual immorality, because sin always leaves scars. Yes. It needs to be said. It's time for our kids to know that you can overcome the pressures of this world by getting into God's Word, Amen. being in God's house, yes. and being with God's people. Yes. Now, some of you say, well, maybe I've already, I've already got regrets. Well, you can give them to God. Yes. You can give them to God. Yes. You, can, you can start today yes. with a new beginning. You can start today with a new walk in God. You can. It's right there. The opportunity is available. You see, Josiah also persisted in seeking the Lord. He began to seek God. But it was a process. He didn't, he didn't just start one day and say, Whew, I don't know how many times... I have tried and started a fresh devotion. Yeah, you guys all start and you carry on. It goes well. Start and fail. Start and fail. It's like, oh my goodness, I got to get this together. But, but what happened is maybe we don't hear of his starts and fails so much, but what we see in his life is a consistent growth that, that his devotion to God grew and grew and grew. As he got older and his life, he focused more and more on God. Now I've spoken to the kids, and the kids may feel picked on, but let me speak to everybody else in the room, those who are older than kids. There is, there's a trend that's happening all across the world, and especially happening in our nation, in our country, that as people get older, their zeal for God wanes. They back off. They back down. They, they, they think that they have reached a point where it's no longer theirs. They want to point and say, well, that's for a younger group. No, it is not. As we, as we devote ourselves to God, what happens is we don't wane in our faith and in our, in our, in our growth in God, but we go up. We increase in the things of God. Come on. Yes. Come on. Right. We, we, don't, we don't do less, we do more. Mm -hmm. You're not sure about that. <laughs> oh, well, Pastor, you don't know how busy I am. What is that? What is that? Mm. It's an excuse. Because what we know as adults is we know better. But when we, when we, even like Judah, have seen, have seen what God has done to Israel. Yes. And we hear the word of the Lord that says, repent, turn, return yes. to your first love. Yes. We hear it and we don't pay attention. It's 
time for us to pay attention to the word of the Lord. So it doesn't matter, kids. I spoke to kids. I speak to everybody else. If you haven't increased in your devotion and your zeal for God, today is the day to make that decision. Today is the day to turn and say, God, I have sinned against you. I have backed down. I've let society, I've let the word of the world tell me that I can back down, back off, and sit down. But I, today I hear that it's time to stand up speak up and be counted in the things of the Lord. Amen. What we need is Jesus. Now Josiah, I know I'm a little bit close to being done here, but Josiah, though he went on in his life and he did right before the Lord, his life was cut off short because he made what seems to be one misstep. He deviated one day, one time, off of the things of the Lord. You see, Pharaoh Necho was passing through Judah to go and fight another enemy. And Pharaoh comes and this pagan king says to Josiah, my fight is not with you. I am not at war with you. And in fact, if you go and read it, he says, your God has said, I am not to fight with you. I am just passing through. But Josiah doesn't inquire of God. He takes on himself. He disguises himself. I don't know why he needed to do that, because that's, that's something that Ahab did. But he disguises himself, and he goes in, and he attacks them. And he is fatally wounded and dies. At the young age of 31. 39. 39. Why? Because he, he didn't follow what was right to do. Proverbs 4, 25 and 27, 27 says, Look straight ahead and do not fix your eyes on what lies before you. Mark out a straight path for your feet. Stay on the safe path. Don't get sidetracked. Keep your feet from following took a detour and he lost his life. If you're on a detour, get back on the road. Kids, set your focus. Adults, get back on the road. It's time for us to change a nation. And it begins with Father, I thank you for your word today. Lord, we see that even out of the ruins of a fallen nation, out of a broken down temple, Lord, you have raised up a man. Lord, to bring peace, to bring direction. Lord, to show a nation that they could return. Thank you, Father. Lord, that you have spoken your word so clearly to us today. Lord, our declaration is, and I pray that it is those of all who hear me today, we return to you. Lord, we come back to you with youthful zeal. Lord, as the young people bring their zeal and their energy to the things of God and not the things of the world. Thank you, Father, for the life of Josiah. We've learned, we take heed, we hear the prophetic voice, and we turn to you. We pray this in